Hey guys, welcome back to Medicine Deconstructed. I'm your host, Dr. Jay Rutland. I appreciate all the subscriptions. If you want to subscribe, go ahead and hit that subscribe button right below. Today, we're going to spend some time talking about asthma in your children. As we move towards the beginning of the school year and into the winter time, we're going to see a whole lot of asthma exacerbations. What I aim to do today is give you what you need as a parent so you can understand not only your child's disease, but the management of it. Thanks for joining and please listen ahead. people, almost 9 million people, are children. Asthma is the leading cause of chronic illness in children. And it's also the leading disease that is most responsible for missed school days. That asthma is more common in boys than girls when people are less than 18 years old. When you get up in adulthood, it's more common in women. There's probably a hormonal contribution that leads to that. Moving forward, when you think about kids under 18 that have asthma, half of them have an exacerbation in a year's time. In the late 60s, we looked at about 400 kids with asthma. We followed them as children into adulthood, and we wanted to know the people who had asthma symptoms the most severely, did they demonstrate asthma later on in adulthood? And it turns out the more severe symptoms you had as a child, the more likely you were to have asthma as an adult. Unfortunately, it does not escape the healthcare disparities. African-American children, children that look like me, are more likely to die from an asthma exacerbation when compared to white children. Think about it. The prevalence of asthma has gone up since the 1980s. Why is that? Well, let's think about the air and pollution and certain environmental factors. If you live next to a freeway, you're gonna inhale tire dust in addition to all of the auto exhaust. If you live in an industrialized area, you're going to inhale all of the particles that are being expelled in the air. That can cause inflammation. And so it's important to understand that unfortunately, minority children, even myself when I was growing up, we lived next to industrialized areas, next to freeways, next to heavily traffic areas, that probably led to some of this inflammation. So when you're sitting there as a parent and you're looking inside yourself and you're like, what did I do? How did I contribute to my son's or to my daughter's illness? Understand that some of these things are out of your control. It just so happens that's where you live. So with that being said, let's go inside the body, take a dive in and look at what asthma actually is. What's up, Pollen? How you doing? So it looks like we're in the airway. Let's talk about what surrounds us. Once this allergen or this antigen hits this airway epithelial cell, the airway epithelial cell is going to secrete certain cytokines, what we call alarmins or damps, damage associated molecular patterns. These are labeled interleukin 25, interleukin 33, and TSLP, thymic stromal lymphopoietin. Once these cytokines communicate with the dendritic cell, the dendritic cell is then going to communicate with a naive T cell. It's going to differentiate itself into the Th2 cell. Now, the Th2 cell is then going to secrete its own set of cytokines. Here we're talking interleukin-4, interleukin-5, interleukin-9, and interleukin-13. Interleukin-4 will end up stimulating the B cell to what's called isotype switch. So instead of the B cell producing all kinds of antibodies, it's going to specifically produce IgE and IgG1. Remember what IgE does as an antibody. It's gonna end up binding to the three cousins that I've referred to so many times. The eosinophil, the basophil, and the mast cell. These cells are full of different types of granules and when those inflammatory mediators get released, you have the perpetuation of the inflammatory response. Now, 
there's one cell on the other side, the non-allergic side we call it, called the innate lymphoid cell. The innate lymphoid cell, type 2, is a type of white blood cell that secretes different types of cytokines. And once those cytokines are produced, you get this massive amount of inflammation, which leads to aggravation of the smooth muscle, bronchoconstriction, mucus production, airway inflammation, and an asthma exacerbation that we would like to stop. Whoa, she must have just taken a puff of her albuterol or this inhaled cortical steroid. Let's talk about the therapies of asthma. In children, when you're looking at therapy of asthma, you're going to be able to use inhaled cortical steroids, which are going to calm down the inflammation once they're in your airway. That's just fine. You can use a long-acting beta agonist, which is going to dilate that airway. You're also going to use maybe a long-acting muscarinic antagonist, which is going to dilate the airway, as you can see here. And you're also going to use other controller medicines like Singular or Montelukast, or even an oral antihistamine like a Zyrtec or a Zyzol. When you're looking at specific therapies, so cellular communication inhibitors, we talked about the pathophysiology of asthma. In children, there's really only two cellular communication inhibitors, or biologics as they're commonly called, approved. One is omalizumab or Zolaire, which is an anti-IgE molecule which inhibits the antibody IgE. And then the other one is Nucala, which is mepolizumab, which is also another monoclonal antibody that inhibits interleukin-5. Both of these molecules are effective, and they both reduce exacerbations of asthma in children, especially children who have severe asthma. So when you're thinking about asthma treatment and your child continues to have exacerbations and they're on the cortical steroid inhaling and they're on the long-acting beta agonist, there are other options to upgrade therapy. So listen, today what I wanted to discuss was asthma in your child. I wanted you to be armed with information so that you can ask your pediatrician or your pediatric pulmonologist or pediatric allergist about therapies and how you should manage your child moving forward. I think it's our responsibility as parents to keep our children as safe as possible. And right here, right now, I'm just trying to give you some of that information to add to that. I really appreciate you guys being here today on Medicine Deconstructed. Thanks for joining me. Hit that subscription button. Follow on YouTube. Follow on Instagram. Follow on Facebook at Dr. J. Rutland. Really appreciate it. Thanks again for coming.